So my name is Jeff Kolesnikovich. I am the WebSocket guy. Uh, we're going to talk about WebSockets for the next hour-ish. Um, you know what figures, as soon as I get in the room, my demo doesn't work. I, I just went to test it, so there might not be a demo. Anyway, I'm a brand new speaker, and relatively new. Uh, I've been speaking for about a, less than a year now. And um, I encourage you, all of you, to get out there. All of you know something that is useful and valuable. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to put this, this is my favorite of those O'Reilly, uh, O'Reilly <laughs> images ever. Um, exactly. Um, the good thing about being a speaker is you don't have to pay $1,500 to uh, sit on Slack all day. You can do it for free. <laughs> I'm kidding, kind of. Um, so we're talking about real-time applications with PHP. Um, I want to get a few definitions out of the way. It'll make the rest of it a little clearer, I hope. Um, so ever since the dawn of the internet, we've been looking to find a way to update the web browser with real-time information. Um, as web pages have increased in complexity, we've changed the approach we've used to getting new data onto the browser. And real time is the goal. Like you want to be able to open a page and get real time um, stock quotes or, or ho uh, game scores. I'm, a, I'm, I'm from Canada, so everything's hockey. There's no sports, there's only hockey. Um, anyway, real time is the goal. And we want to update the, the web page with new information as soon as it's available. Now, how do we do that? Here's, a, here's another definition, half versus full duplex. Half duplex means uh, communication can go one way at a time. So the web browser can send information to the server or the server can send information to the browser, but it doesn't work both ways. Full duplex means you can send it both ways. The client can talk to the server, the server can talk to the client, and there's that open communication between the two. So maybe I'm, I'm dating myself, but this is the old way we used to do it. The browser would refresh every so often, and we'd get new information on the page. That's maybe not the best approach. Um, and actually, um, one of the, I, I mentioned sports earlier, and one of the sports sites that I read actually still does this. That's, that's how they refresh the page and get new scores on it. It's absolutely embarrassing. <laughs> So this is the old way, Ajax, and this is half duplex. So over time, your browser says, hey, is there anything new? And the web server says, maybe. Well, no, not this time, but you know, ask again in a minute. And there's this process over and over again of, of the browser requesting new information from the server, and the server responds. Now there's a few problems with this approach. One is every time you do a request, it takes some amount of time to establish the, the connection, get the data back, process the data, and go from there. Um, another problem is that we don't know who's actually connected to the server. And that's really important for games because these could be different browsers. Well, not this. The response is going to come back to the same browser. But that could be a different browser from that. And if you have, that doesn't scale, this, this approach doesn't scale all that well. If you have a thousand browsers looking for information, that's a whole lot of polling, a whole lot of startup time and a whole lot of um, waiting. This is another approach, uh, long polling. So your browser goes and asks the web, talks to the web server, says, is there anything new? And once there is new information, the server sends the data back. So this is actually what Facebook uses, or it did a couple years ago. Um, and they used it, they used this approach because uh, WebSockets weren't all that, there, there wasn't WebSockets to use really. So this time here, the web server, the web server request is just holding on to that 
um, request from the browser and doesn't send anything back until um, there is an update. Once, once they get a re uh, response from the server, the client makes another request. Uh, the, good, the upside with this is that you do know who's connected to the server, at least for this part. When the browser does the request, you know who's connected. Um, but after here, you're not going to necessarily know who's connected. So this is the, this is WebSockets. So your browser makes a connection to the server. Um, and then once that connection is established, they talk back and forth because you have, um, you have the, a persistent connection. The connection's made, you've authenticated it. Um, so you know who's connected. Um, there's also no startup time for a request. You've already formed the, re the uh, connection. So um, all the server or the browser has to do is make a, is make a request or send some information. And the other thing that's neat, and, and this is uh, full duplex, by the way, the other thing that's neat is either side can, connect, can terminate the connection. So the server can say, okay, we're done, we're done here. And then the browser um, doesn't work anymore. So let's talk about WebSockets. They're part of uh, HTML5 and um, they're the W3C's attempt at real-time communication for web browsers. Now I'm sure this approach is gonna change over time um, as, as all technology does. But this is this is the the new hotness right now. The good news is it's uh, this has been around since about 2008, I believe. Um, so it's been adopted by most of most web browsers. Um, the first time I gave this talk, there was a big red eight here under IE, um, and that's a that's that's a whole fun ball game. Um, you have to you have to have a workaround for IE8, um, but you can see a, a small sliver here. This is um, web browsers by uh, market share, I believe. So um, while IE8 is disappearing, it's still not gone. So where are WebSockets used? Um, social media is. An obvious one to me, it's easy to implement a chat with WebSockets. Uh, you want real-time communica communication between people. Um, something like Facebook Messenger would probably use it. Um, updating your feed, not necessarily that, like I said before, that's, that's for, um, uh, they use long polling for that. Uh, online games is an obvious one. Um, you want to update the screen as soon as somebody else makes a move. Um, something like chess, maybe not, but you know, a, a real-time game between two people, absolutely. Collaborating documents. Uh, Trello uses WebSockets to push uh, changes to collaborators if they, if they both have uh, the screen open. And it does fall back to Ajax if you're using Internet Explorer 8. And tracking live data, so stuff like sports scores, uh, financial tickers, that sort of thing. So with PHP, the Im implementation is, is such that you need a WebSocket server, and that's usually written, well, that can be written in whatever you want, but in this case, we're writing in PHP. Uh, and you have your browser, JavaScript. Now, since WebSockets are built into your browser, uh, you have access to it. Was anybody else like a giant networking nerd in, in university or college? Like, did you ever build like those, those crappy servers that you just fire up and then you tell that into and like you felt like a, a big person because you just echoed it back and you're like, yeah, I'm huge. So that's this. Um, so that's, this is a traditional socket in PHP. So we're creating the socket, we're binding it to a port and an address and then we start listening. And that's, I just wanted to show you how much goes into building a, a, a web socket, or a, sorry, a, a, a traditional socket. Um, you can actually run this, and um, I have a little more code that I'll share with you later. Um, and 
you can tell that to it and type some stuff and it echoes it out on the screen. It's, it's awesome. Um, so, yeah. WebSockets are a little different. They're, they're similar, but they're different. So when you make a connection to a WebSocket, you're actually connecting to an endpoint, so slash chat. And you, you request slash chat, and the web server sends back an upgrade, a 426 upgrade. And then it sends, um, yeah, an upgrade, uh, switching protocols. And that opens the stream to the WebSocket server. So you have a, it's, you have a WebSocket server and you have the HTTP server and they kind of work together here. Um, so really the main difference is the upgrade request for when you request slash chat. Now, since JavaScript has this, um, has WebSockets built in, um, building something with Node is pretty straightforward. We're not here to talk about Node but I wanted to show you the six lines of code it takes to make a, a WebSocket server in, in Node. And that's using um, Socket.io, I believe. Yeah, Socket.io. Um, and so that is the server-side JavaScript. Doesn't it feel weird to say so server-side JavaScript still? Yeah, I know it's been around forever. For PHP, we have something called Ratchet. And this is WebSockets for PHP. It's a library. Um, it's got hooks for, it, it has a WebSocket server built in. Um, it has an HTTP server to do the 426 upgrade. And um, it's got all the uh, events. So uh, we'll, we'll get into the, the events in a minute, but stuff like receiving a message, sending a message. <laughs> So this is a really basic WebSocket server, um, written, that's written with Ratchet, and you can see the um, HTTP server is built in, and then there's a WebSocket server, and then inside that is the new chat, and that is the actual class that you're, you build. You, you would go and build as a, as a developer and implement the um, interfaces. So you're instantiating the object that actually runs the server. The rest just gives you the functionality. So don't worry if you can see if you can't see that. Um, I'll go into a little more detail in a sec. But this chat class is implementing the message component interface. So that means you have to implement those methods: the on open, on message, on close, on error. And I'll explain those in a second. Um, So you'll have to take my word for it, but uh, SP, there's an SPL storage, object storage. And um, when uh, a new client makes a connection to the server, it takes that connection that gets passed into the on open and attaches it to the SPL object storage. And so then we know who's, who exactly is connected to the server. And that's extra useful because I'll show you in a second. Well, and then on close is, is in this case, you're doing the opposite. You're detaching it from the SPL storage. So on message, this is, this is a little more interesting. So when we receive the message, um, it's looping through all of the clients that are in the SPL object. And if the from is not the client, so if, if, the person sending the message is not in that list, or as you loop through it, the user who sent the message doesn't get sent that message. So everybody else gets the, the message that was just received, and then it fires it out to all the other connected clients. On the other side, um, this is, so this is the client side, and this is a whole lot simpler. That web so socket object is built into your browser. Um, so all you have to do is really implement the, the on connect, on open, on close portions. 
So you can actually tell if your browser is connected to the WebSocket server and you can maybe force it to try to reconnect or display a message to your users. And all I'm doing on on message is on message is when it gets when a message gets received. So all I'm doing is prepending something that says, you know, it's not me sending the message. And then again, from the client side, um, and sorry for the jQuery, I know it's ugly, um, but when you, when you actually click the send button, it takes the value of the message and um, sends it to the connection. That's what con.send is doing. Now, this is the part where I was going to do the demo, but we're on a flaming plane that's crashing into the ocean right now and my demo's not working. <laughs> So I apologize. Um, but what I wanted to show you is, um, and, I, and I have a demo, you can try this at home. Um, I'll give you the link at the end of the presentation. Um, but I have a, a demo on GitHub that you can try all this stuff out with. Um, so you fire up the, the socket server and then you connect your browser to it. And you know if it makes the connection, great, if not, um, it'll display an error and um, what's neat is if you kill the, the, the server the web browser will actually say disconnected. I find that kind of stuff fascinating. <laughs> um, and then you can actually open, I have a client-side version of that um, and you can open two or three different ones, uh, connect to the same socket server and then they can all chat with each other. but I don't have that, so we're not going to look at that today. <laughs> the WAMP protocol um, came about from um, um, WebSockets. From the, it, it branched out, it came from the, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, WAMP came from WebSockets. They think it's a, a better approach to doing WebSockets. And what WAMP gives you are two things, uh, RPC and PubSub. RPC is making a specific um, request to a uh, method that you're, obviously, that you're, you're exposing. Um, so maybe you can say, give me a list of connected clients or give me the score of the Leaf game, whatever that is. Um, and then PubSub, you can, it's, think of it like a chat. You can publish things to a certain channel and everybody who's subscribed to that channel will get those messages. Um, now, there's a WAMP version two that came out about a year ago and unfortunately Ratchet only supports WAMP version one. Um, but that's still good enough to play with. So this is what the WAMP protocol gives you. You get an on open Similar to, um, similar to the other web sockets, you get an on open, on close, so you can still, you know, when somebody connects, you can connect that, attach that to the SPL storage or however you're, you're maintaining your list of, of connected clients. Um, on call is for RPC calls. So if I make, if I, I get that information, the topic means um, in this case, that was confusing. That took me like a day to figure out what that meant. Not really a day, but a, um, that's the method that's being called. And then you get some parameters you can pass in. So, um, so I let's say you call login. You'll in your topic you'll get login, and then you'll and then in the parameters you would pass in the username and password and any other information you need to pass. Unsubscribe and un unsubscribe. So that's subscribing to a topic. Um, what do you want? What do you want to happen if somebody subscribes to a, a topic or unsubscribes? And unpublish. Publish to a, a topic. So let's say I'm I'm sending something out to a topic that gets published, and then we have an on air. Um, so with RPC calls, RPC calls, our remote procedure calls, you can call custom functions. 
This is a one-to-one -one communication with a server. So this is for instances where you need um, a user is going to be working um, on something differently from the rest of the users. So this is one-to-one -one communication. Um, this is stuff like uh, communication between browsers and games and, and things like that. Uh, and by, sorry, between, by communication between servers, I mean, oh, sorry, sorry. This is, this is a bit of a new talk. I, I, I rejigged it, so I forget a, a bit of this. Um, the server can actually make a request to the browser and, and vice versa. That's the uh, full duplex. And pub sub. So one way to use this, and I'm kind of getting into Bitcoin right now. Not Bitcoin, but what's the other one? Ethereum. Um, and I've got servers communicating with each other. And they're actually using WebSockets to, um, and, and they subscribe to topics. So um, when each server needs, when, when the configuration changes, you can subscribe all of those servers to one topic and then fire out uh, an upgrade request or a, a configuration change. Um, this is not limited to one-to-one -one communication. So this scales a whole lot better than uh, RPC calls, RPC, remote procedure calls. Um, and this, one important thing to note is that a client cannot request information outside of what's published. So I worked on a um, project. It's actually a, a game. Uh, it's a training tool. And I can show you later if you're, you're interested. Um, but what it is, is what it does is, um, the way it used to work is it was built with Ajax and uh, every, every five minutes, the game would save itself. But what would happen between those five minutes is the browser would crash or the server would go down or you know, there'd be some sort of problem and the person playing the game would lose their information. Um, so we attempted, the, the idea was to make it so that um, a user could have, uh, making it a lot more um, robust. Uh, so we use WebSockets for it. So every time somebody did something on the game, it would fire out a save request and then update your score. Um, the scoring would happen on the server, not in the browser. And it was real time-ish because it was a whole lot faster than doing it with Ajax. And there wasn't that five minute delay between the two. So now that I've done that, um, I have a few suggestions if you're looking to implement uh, WebSockets in your application. PHP just isn't good at running 24-7. I'm a PHP developer. Uh, please don't think I hate PHP. I don't. Um, but we've had all sorts of crashes with it, and I hope to save you guys some, some of that angst and, and late nights that I had. Um, we also had just random crashes and we actually had to dig into, we, we did a, a, we had PHP core dumping and all sorts of fun stuff. And also we had to deal with firewalls and proxies. So I don't know if you can see that, but that's a core dump. And um, that was not a fun day. But what the real problem was, was the Redis read and write was um, the Redis server was dying. And it wasn't dying, sorry, that's, that's not true. There was a persistent connection between PHP and Redis, and then Redis would time out because nobody was using that connection, and then Redis would go away. So we had to turn off persistent connections, and then if this, the, that connection between the WebSocket server and Redis went away, it would uh, reestablish the connection and we would be fine. But that, that took a lot to figure out. Um, U limits. Anybody know what a U limit is? What's a U limit? Isn't that the number of open file handles that PHP can have at one time? Excellent answer. 
Uh, yeah, it's by the OS. Um, now, does anybody know the default number of files PHP can have open at any given time? It's 1,024. This is how many files the operating system thinks it can have open, 65,535. So there's, there's that disconnect between the two. Um, PHP only thinks your file handle opener, file, uh, hand, file handle can only go to 1,024. And so it, when it requests um, a file, it crashes. And sorry, the reason this is an issue is because in Unix, everything gets treated like a file. Um, files are files, directories are technically files. Um, and certainly socket connections are files. So as you're opening more and more connections, uh, you need to pay attention to the U limit. So the way to change that in PHP is to recompile PHP. <laughs> so we didn't want to do that. So, um, so unfortunately, right now we have a theoretical of limit limit of 1,024 connections per server. Um, what we did is we limited the we created a new user in uh, on the server, and we set the U limit to 1,024 to match PHP. And um, you can actually create that those two lines in uh, slash etc security slash limits. Um, once we fixed that, we had a whole heck of a lot of less problems. The next problem we ran into was our game. The game we built is for. Um, it's mostly used in universities. And I don't know if any of you have dealt with university IT departments, but they tend to be a little, yes. <laughs> yeah. They lock down their networks like anything. Um, so like I said before, your um, WebSocket server is running on a port. And in general, um, not in general, a lot of the time, um, the overzealous admins um, will block anything above port 1024, which you know makes sense, um, but it's a problem for us. Um, so we need a, we need a way around it. Um, so we had to be a little creative with that, and I'll get into that in a second. Um, so Nginx was came to the rescue. Um, we need to we want to, we also wanted to load balance it. We wanted to monitor it, and we had to get around those firewall um, and proxy servers. So our Nginx config is such that if you connect to, if you request slash WebSocket on port 443, um, Nginx is actually load balancing three WebSocket servers. And here's the configuration for it. And we are going to switch one day to HA proxy. It's just at the bottom of the list of things to do. Uh, here's the configuration for Nginx. So we define our upstream sockets. So they're all on private IPs on port 8000. And if you request slash WebSocket, it's going to, to do a proxy pass to this upstream. And it's also going to force you to do an HTTP upgrade and a connection upgrade. Um, You'll notice this line, this line says, if you can't see it, it says least con. And there are five different strategies for load balancing. And least con is one of them. It means the least connected server of those three will get the next connection. There's also round robin, which is the default one. Um, IP hash, so I guess that, I, I'm not sure what that one is. Um, Hash, which again, I'm not sure what it is. That's my net, that's my sysadmin's job, and uh, least time. So that's the least latency, whichever is the quickest. You can also do, do stuff like uh, server waiting. So if one of those servers is beefier than the other ones, 
you can send more connections to it. There's, there's all kinds of stuff you can do with that. I, that's not necessarily my area. Um, so load balancing helps. Um, but what if one of those three go down? It takes a certain number of failures for uh, a node to actually be considered down by Nginx. So your users still might be getting down messaging. Um, so they might need to refresh or, or try to reconnect. We are monitoring our WebSocket servers by polling each one. And we're sending just like a, I built in a hello world RPC call. And if you get a hello world back, you know it's up. But if you don't, then we get, then it sends a message to Logly and enough Logly notifications. And we know the node is down and we know to go, know to go we know to go and reboot it. Now, because I like you guys, everybody, I'm going to give you a business tip. Nobody's doing WebSocket monitoring that I know of. I'm sure somebody's going to put up their hand and say, I know some. The big boys aren't doing WebSocket monitoring. Um, New Relic supports process monitoring, but that's a little different from actually monitoring the port to make sure that the server is up. So go start a WebSocket server monitoring business. <laughs> so that's New Relic. Um, you can see our app is only using about 35 megs of memory and that's our CPU load. So that's actually, that's actually from production. That's one of the servers and you can see it doesn't use a, use a whole lot of resources. <laughs> Taking out my demo really killed, uh, we're only a half an hour in. <laughs> Um, so WebSockets, they're, you know, they're a whole lot faster than Ajax. Use them. They're, they're a fun toy. Um, they, there are some caveats. Um, definitely use a server or uh, sorry, a, a library like Ratchet. It gives you a whole lot of, of, um, functionality for free. Um, that code example of, um, a socket server, that's a whole lot of work to implement that in. Uh, PHP. Use, the, use Ratchet, use something similar to it. Do know that you're running a separate server and you have to monitor that somehow. If that goes down, that's your connection. Your clients won't, the, the users won't be able to connect. They'll be unhappy. Um, one thing we do is if the server can't, or if you can't connect to the server, um, the application actually says, sorry, cannot connect. And then we have a retry button. So you can click that and it'll retry to, it'll try to reconnect to the server. Doesn't always work, but that's the idea. Um, and actually, since we implemented this, I think we've had maybe a half a dozen incidences over the last two years of the WebSocket server being down of, of downtime that actually can be pointed at the WebSocket server. Um, so if you build this right, um, you can get a whole lot of stability out of it. So here's the URLs. Um, this is the WebSocket demo that I was going to um, demonstrate. Unfortunately, I couldn't. Um, there's the link for Ratchet. More about the WAMP protocol and uh, the Node.js library. Um, are there any questions I can answer? Um, so for earlier when you were discussing the I was curious though that you mentioned the other alternative was like having that process under a user with a hard limit on the OS. Yeah. And I was wondering how does how does that mitigator solve that problem? Like it feels like right. you're still running that. File Sorry, I didn't explain that very well. Right. <coughs> so the U limit, the U limit is set on the operating system, so you can actually change that. So if you set it to 1,024, it's not going to go above a file handle of 1,024. So it matches PHP's 1,024. So what happens when PHP wants to open 1,025? Will it still throw the same error about not being able to do that though? Loops around. Oh. So it goes back to zero or one. But it doesn't, so that's, it'll just like, if there's a file handle that was just not cleaned up, it'll go back and reuse that? Yeah. Okay. It might not go back to one, but it'll, it'll, 
So Start the, over. So, if, so the new limits by themselves don't like garbage collect is the problem, and doing that will force it to try and go back around again? No, it's not garbage collection. It's it, it might try to hand PHP might ask for a file a, a file handle, and um, you know, the operating system might hand. Sorry. It doesn't like the answer it gets. <laughs> and so it crashes. I was thinking, like, even with the hard, the, the limit there that forces to go back to zero again, it's like, but what if zero is already held? Then, you know, well, it'll it'll increment. It'll it, the operating system knows what file handles are open. Okay. So it's it's going to decide what file handle to hand PHP when it when PHP requests a new file handle. Okay. Um, if there were still like, if it was still trying to open 1,025 sockets or had that open at once, and none of them were free up to use again. Well, that's why the theoretical limit is about a thousand users. Okay. All right. Just wanted to be sure. Thank you. No, that it's a good question. That's where load balancing comes into play. That is exactly where load balancing comes into play. So we have three servers. We don't come anywhere near three thousand users at a given time. We maybe have a hundred on nice each server. The aiming setting or something, just like you limit equals maybe one. <laughs> <laughs> it would be. Yeah, we should probably use this because uh, uh, since we're being recorded, uh, they can hear me. Oh. Uh, yeah. So I know that people that were doing this a few years back with Drupal, they were putting Node.js in front of it. Yep. And Node.js, uh, since it's asynchronous, seemed to be pretty good at handling ridiculously large numbers of, uh, of web sockets. And then there was some kind of proxy game that uh, went back to, uh, to Drupal. God knows how uh, exactly they did that. Uh, is that still a strategy that people are using? So, so I was doing some re researching for this talk, surprise. Um, and Trello uses it. And they found, the, there's a blog post by Joel Spolsky about WebSockets. And he talks about how Socket.io can only handle about 10,000 users per node. Um, so they still have those problems with, um, uh, with node. Um, that was one of the things we considered doing uh, when building our game, is going through a Node.js socket server. The reason we didn't is because um, we wanted to use some of the functionality in our legacy PHP app. Um, and we didn't want to build an API. Like that seemed like a whole lot of work to build an API just to talk to this back and forth. Um, and at the time, the MySQL driver for Node.js was flaky at best. It was still immature and, and um, I know it's gotten a lot better since then. Um, so that kind of limited us with what we could do. It is a strategy. If it works for you, great. Um, it's picking your poison. Absolutely, it is. Um, I don't like extra hops. I like as simple as possible. One hop between the client and the server. So that's why I took that approach. You had to build it again, would you go to the same structure? Given um, technology today versus two years ago? I don't know. I wasn't prepared for that question. Would I go for that? Um, you know what? Considering the success of, of the application and it does run and it runs really well, I probably would. And we haven't had a whole lot of breakdowns. Um, so yeah, yeah, I would. Sorry. Yeah, an example of the social feed, is the PHP side like doing long polling of its own or is it like Every time one of your friends has a message, it's distributing it accordingly to like the private rules. Or, you know. So the application is decide. So you send you send a request to the server, and then the server says, "Hold on, I'm gonna I'll get back to you." And then once the server decides what information, and that can come from anywhere. It can come from PHP. It can come from Cold Fusion. It can come from whatever you want, and then it sends it back. Yeah, but then so. Does PHP go check again? Go, does the script check again later, or it's just responding to other people? It's just responding to other people. So it's your that that request is going over and over again. 
So you make the request, it returns information, you make the request again, and wait for uh, more the, data. The new stuff is just other people sending messages in to trigger yes. more distribution. Stuff. Yes, exactly. Anything else? Yeah? I'm sorry if you covered this, but I mean, um, okay. sorry, I can't. Oh, I'm sorry. So, one thing I want to build a little bit more, more expectation on is if a client browser crashes, shuts down, do you get a clean exit? Yeah, you do. Um, so, this is server side and you're going to get, it'll trigger the on-close um, event. Is there a way to detect a clean exit for a, a crash or a... I think you would have to build that into the application. Okay. Um, oh, so, you know what? Sorry, that's not true. You're going to get... You can get an on-error message. And, and I'm sorry, this is tiny. Um, but you will get an... an an error notification if something goes catastrophically wrong. Can you put the uh, URL back up on yep. the screen? Yep. Nice. That's, um, and actually this is at the top of my, it's pinned at the top of my Twitter account. So if you uh, forget to do that, um, you can just go to my Twitter and it's there. Yeah. And this will be up on YouTube, uh, if not tomorrow, then uh, a couple days. It'll, this will be up on YouTube in a couple days. Uh, did you have any, uh, so since your application's a bit long lived and um, I was just wondering if you ever had like the migration from like a PHP 5 to PHP 7 or if there was any changes in any of those. We're still on PHP 5 um, just because we haven't tested the code base on 7 yet. Okay. Uh, so I don't know yet. I'm, I'm a little anxious about that. Yeah, if it isn't broke. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't break it. Yeah. But does that have more to do with like the WAMP protocol and, and Ratchet too? Like it could, yeah. Because, uh, there's some interesting messaging going on behind the scenes in Ratchet. Did I miss anything? Anybody? All right. Thanks very much.